Hi, this is Eric Postowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. With me is my friend and excellent electrophysiologist, Dr. Charles Burrell at uh, uh, Children's National Hospital. And we're going to discuss today congenital heart block. So, Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric, for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, this is a topic that's a crossover, right? Because we as adult electrophysiologists also see it. Let's start from the beginning, though. It, how is it initially diagnosed, and uh, you know, how do you view it in, in, in the pediatric age group? Sure, you're right. It's a, a combination of both pediatric and adult cardiology because it's typically uh, diagnosed in pregnancy. And so when the pregnant woman has a low uh, fetal heart rate, and the obstetrician uh, will get concerned about why is the fetus bradycardic. And one of the causes of bradycardia is congenital heart block. Um, the most common cause is maternal lupus or having the lupus antibody, even if she doesn't have the systemic lupus disease, she could still have the antibody. And it's uh, surprising, uh, but the, the antibody to lupus attacks the AV node in utero and causes congenital heart block. And so it, it's, uh, it's diagnosed early uh, with fetal ultrasound, getting the heart rate. So as you suspect it, um, do you, I know this is out of my realm, but uh, do you have to do something like, is, is the fetus in trouble? Do you typically have to get the baby uh, out? Or, or, I mean, what, what is the actual plan at that point? Right, well, as, as you'd expect, it's, it's rate related. And so the lower the fetal escape rate, the less well the fetus does. And if the rate's not, um, not high enough of a, of a ventricular escape rate, there's usually fetal demise. And uh, so far there have not been successes at fetal pacing for more than a day or two. Uh, and so that's really been the holy grail is fetal pacing. So uh, short of that, uh, therapies include an anti-inflammatory medications if uh, you can catch it before complete heart block. And so there's been several studies that look at treating mothers with, uh, with prednisone or some other steroid uh, at the onset of first degree AV block, if you can catch it that early, or maybe early second degree block, but before it progresses. Once you get to complete heart block, it's pretty much irreversible, and you get the fetus as far as you can before delivery okay. uh, and uh, early neonatal pacing. So let's say you deliver the fetus, but the fetus is doing okay. I mean, you're not worried about the fetus, the heart rate's good enough, or maybe, or maybe that doesn't happen, I don't know. Right. Are there situations where you can just wait it out? Sure, yeah, if the heart rate's, you know, fetal escape rate is 70, you know, the normal baby heart rate is about 140, 150, so a fetal heart rate of 70 is quite low, but, but usually adequate. When it gets below about 55 or so, then they usually uh, need some support. Uh, and so early pacing is really the, the goal for those for those newborns if they, if they come out with a fetal heart rate of uh, you know, 55 or below. When you say pacing, now again, this is all foreign to me as an adult. Uh, are you actually talking about putting at that point a permanent pacemaker in? Uh, what I, do you do? Right, unfortunately, yes. Right now there's no uh, pacemaker on the market uh, specifically designed for infants or even for children for that matter uh, because of the the business model right there's there's not a lot of these babies that are being born you're talking about you know less than a hundred a year in the country and maybe maybe uh, you know less than a few hundred worldwide that that could benefit from a neonatal pacemaker and so there's not really a, a for-profit uh, you know shareholder uh, cause to right. do that so uh, People are innovating. If the baby's uh, big enough, we'll put in an, um, a standard pacemaker. Uh, we usually put it in the abdomen and put it in an epicardial lead. Uh, the surgeon would put on an epicardial lead and attach it uh, that way uh, because the veins are usually too small, uh, particularly in a premature infant that has to be delivered early because of the heart block uh, or because they have other forms of uh, congenital heart disease that may go along with it. Um, we and others are trying to develop a more miniaturized pacemaker specifically for use in this situation. Yeah, I, I, I remember you telling me about that. Can you uh, tell us what's going on in that area? Yeah, there, there's a few different places that are that are working on uh, developing their own sort of unique pacemaker. What we're trying to do is, is develop something that's uh, percutaneous through the size of either a large needle or a small straw to put on in, into the pericardial space uh, th uh, through a port and uh, deliver the pacemaker that way, and uh, or at least a pacing lead at the very least, if not a whole integrated pacemaker. Uh, 
it, right now it's uh, still in animal studies, preclinical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a piglet born with congenital heart block, you're in luck. But if you're a baby human, uh, we're not quite ready for prime time yet. So do, uh, do adult mother pigs get lupus? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've always heard about, you know, look, and I, and I know it's one of the things I've been taught to teach, you know, even adults, is to look for the lupus antibodies. Right. But what's the percent? So like what percent actually of, of congenital heart block turns out to have the lupus antibody issue of the con of the babies with congenital heart block probably about half about are half. due to maternal lupus un unless they have congenital heart disease there's certain forms of uh, congenital heart disease that like uh, l looping of the uh, l transposition uh, that are associated with with congenital heart block but otherwise the ones with a structurally normal heart about half of them are due to maternal lupus antibody okay yeah so let's go now do a transition if you would for me charlie into the adult uh, yeah. Because obviously, as an adult electrophysiologist, um, I see them later on, and the usual story is somebody felt a slow pulse. Right. And when you talk to the patient, you ask them uh, if people always said you have a slow pulse, and they said, yeah, but they've been fine. Right. So now I see them, and they're actually doing fine, they're just set, and they have a narrow QRS, it looks like classic you know, congenital complete heart block. And they're doing fine. And, you know, I read the pediatric literature, like uh, it's a little scary at times if, you know, sudden death can occur and what rate. And I've never been comfortable, honestly, with that whole area because um, I, it's really anecdotal more than anything, right? So would you what would you recommend to the adult po uh, group right. of how to manage the asymptomatic patient who comes in like that. Right, and you're absolutely right. There are some patients that come in uh, either as teenagers or young adults that, you know, that's their first presentation of symptomatic uh, or, or incidentally identified complete heart block. And as you said, if their escape rate is okay, uh, there's not an urgent need for pacing. The, I don't want to go against the guidelines on TV. Uh, it's a class two indication for congenital heart block with an adequate escape rate once you're uh, adult size, teenager or adult size. And so, that, but you're right, that, that's, it's based on uh, old data and right. anecdotal uh, information of the potential for sudden death. We do recommend that if you're an adolescent and older uh, with uh, complete heart block that's, that's presumed to be non-reversible, that we do recommend a pacemaker on a non-urgent basis. Well, so I have, several patients who have simply not wanted it so yeah. i'm not ever unhappy saying it on tv that i don't want to go against a patient's wishes and if their rate is 45 50 and they can exercise and they usually get a junctional rate up to 110 or 20 and they're okay i've not felt compelled to put a pacemaker right. um because it's really not hard data right you're right and and i guess um that's why the guidelines are guidelines and and a class two whether it's 2a or 2b it uh, doesn't mean you have to do it, right? As you right. know, and it's, it takes, you know, the clinician, you know, common sense and uh, experience like you uh, to make those decisions along with the, the, the patients, the sort of shared decision-making with the, with the patient to decide if and when they need a pacemaker. Unfortunately, it's not a class one or a class three, so it's not as, uh, strong, not as strong of a yeah, guide. The twos, are, the twos are crazy, right? Yeah, yeah for all of us. Um, well, Charlie, this has been a great discussion. It's going to be uh, very useful to the listeners. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me.